Okay. Should I get started then? Yep. Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the 14th ECS and Cloud Feedback Symposium. We have a very special installment today because we have a special format, PhD and postdoc lightning talks. So unlike our uh, usual setup, we actually have six talks today, a lot of exciting talks. Uh, each of them is going to be only five minutes. Uh, after each talk, there will be three minutes for some questions, and then we're going to have a general Q&A after the last talk. So if you do have any questions uh, or comments, feel free to type them into the chat. Or if you want to ask your question live, uh, just raise your hand, and when the Q&A time comes around, Nick will unmute you. The uh, ECS symposium is organized by uh, these wonderful people, Nick, Shia, Andy, Christy, and uh, myself. If you want to give a talk, please reach out uh, to us uh, at our website, which you can see here. Uh, or if you can also see lots of great information like videos of past talks, uh, or you can sign up for our mailing list. And so uh, without further ado, let's, we'll go to our first talk for today. Uh, that's gonna be from Angshuman Modak, a postdoc at, this, at Stockholm University. Here, let me uh, stop sharing so that Angshuman can get his, uh, his slides up. So uh, Angshuman will be talking about the historical pattern effect uh, as looked at across different temperature, uh, uh, temperature data sets. So everyone can see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Uh, so uh, hello, everyone. I'm Angshuman Modak from Stockholm University. So I'll be talking about assessing the historical pattern effect estimates and climate sensitivity based on different temperature uh, data sets. So equilibrium climate sensitivity uh, 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 estimates derived from energy budget uh, is sensitive to the pattern of um, uh, surface temperature change. So uh, inference of ECS from the uh, historical energy budget is found to understate the true ECS uh, because the equilibrium surface warming pattern is different from the historical surface warming pattern. Differences in uh, surface warming pattern influences the climate feedback strength, for example, the cloud and lap state feedbacks and in turn the ECS estimates. So this dependency of the uh, ECS estimates or, or the climate feedback estimates on the pattern of surface warming is termed as pattern effect. Uh, one of the way to estimate this pattern effect is forcing the uh, atmosphere only GCMs with observed historical SSTs and CIs changes uh, with pre, uh, and with pre-industrial forcing. And uh, so here in this figure, I regress the change in net top of the atmosphere radiation uh, downward radiation against the change in surface temperature for the uh, uh, abdo four times CO2 with uh, MPI-ESM uh, and the AMIP2 forced MPI-ESM. So you could see that the lambdas are different and these differences in the lambda is termed as the, uh, is one of the major of the pattern effect. So as you could uh, see that uh, in this uh, way to uh, estimate the pattern effect, one, the demand is to input the observed SST data set. So it may happen that if different SST data sets are applied to the models, you might get different estimates of pattern effect. So in this study, I answered this question by applying seven different SST data sets to MPI ESM. Uh, uh, but the ECI changes are same uh, to, to, to see the dependency on the uh, only the SST. Uh, so, uh, and so, so you can see that the lambdas are different for each of these data set and the seven data sets that I have used are applied are MEP2, HADA SST, COBE SST2, ER SST V5, the Kautan Anway and Vakaro et al, any uh, SST data set. So why these SST data sets are different or why the lambdas are different uh, because these different SST data sets are mm, made from different sources and also uh, they are constructed using, uh, and, and, and I mean, to, to complete the spatial coverage, different ways are used. Uh, mm, to, uh, the pattern effect estimates are positive. That is what I have found. In this figure, I show you the delta lambdas, mm, the differences between the uh, lines here, the regression lines here. Uh, for AMIP2 and all the other SST datasets. And I found a positive pattern effect uh, uh, across the datasets. 
and the variability is also of similar magnitude across the data sets. And a positive pattern effect means that the um, uh, observed, uh, I mean, historical SST forced uh, AGCMs gives a more negative lambda compared to the lambda four times CO2. Uh, uh, however, so this has been done for the entire period. You can also see the dependency on the um, uh, on the different periods and uh, which I show you here. So let's focus on the recent period, which is from 1981 to 2017. And you can see that there is a much uh, agreement across the data set the, uh, for the estimate of pattern effect. And the delta lambdas are much positive uh, uh, simply because the uh, lambda uh, press is more negative compared to the lambda four times CO2. So now I have used this uh, pattern effect estimates to update the ECS estimates and that I have done for uh, basically the uh, AR6. So here, uh, this black uh, PDF shows you the uh, effective climate sensitivity from the AR6, which gives a median value of 2.5. And this is the fifth and the 95 percentile range. And uh, when the pattern effect, uh, uh, which is 0.5 in the case of AR6 has been used, this uh, uh, simply uh, increases the median value to 3.5 and the range is even wider. So now uh, I have also, what I have done, I have updated the AR6 estimate with the Andrews 2018 uh, uh, pattern effect estimates. And uh, the new median value for the ECS is much higher than the ER6 estimate. And uh, however, you can see the uh, range is similar to the, uh, when, when the pattern effect from the AR6 has been used. This E star plus AR6 is basically the, um, shows you the um, uh, ECS estimates from the updated ECS estimates from this study's um, dependency on the observed SSTs. And, it seems that the ECS doesn't, uh, is uh, the new, uh, med new median ECS is not that high as compared to the AR6. And when I uh, uh, update the ECS by uh, uh, considering both the uh, data, de data set dependency on the pattern effect and the model dependency on the pattern effect, the median ECS remains to be same. Uh, the other point that you could see here is that the low end of this updated estimates of ECS are similar across, uh, uh, I mean, is similar to the original AR6 estimate, showing a very weak dependency on the pattern effect, whereas the upper end is highly dependent on the pattern effect estimates. Uh, with this, uh, I guess I will stop here. Uh, thank you. Great, thanks. Um, so I'm seeing a question from Christy in the chat. Christy, do you want to ask the question? Yeah, so when you're, AMIP2 seems to be one of the bigger outliers. And I was sort of the impression that the main difference between AMIP2 and head ISST is that AMIP2 is essentially head ISST with an adjustment such that the reinterpolated values preserve the monthly mean. This is the BC Gen or Taylor. Um, adjustment. Uh, are you aware of any other differences? And then when you're doing the, the other data sets like COBE, uh, are you doing that, uh, that BC gen adjustment? Uh, uh, so, um, uh, so in the COBE SST, basically, uh, um, uh, so they are, they are completely the in situ. Uh, so yeah, you are right. First of all, I, I should say that you're right that had I SST, I mean, AMIP2 is completely had I SST until 1981. And afterwards, it is it has taken different methods to um, uh, uh, basically update the ECS, I mean, update, uh, cover the SSTs. Um, whereas in Kobe, uh, the, the SSTs are completely in situ from the in situ measurements, and they have applied uh, the interpolation techniques on, uh, from the satellite observation for only the fluctu—I mean, in, uh, decadal to interannual uh, fluctuations. 
Okay, so for Kobe, you're not making any other adjustment in order to, when you're applying it under an atmospheric model? No. Okay, no. thanks. Okay, great. Um, I think we should uh, move on to the next speaker in the interest of time, but um, there's some more conversation in the chat. So um, I actually want to please check that out and uh, respond yes. to any questions. That come sure, there. sure, yeah. I think I've completed it uh, sooner. Thank you so much, Dr. Um, on our next speaker is going to be Mark Alessi. Uh, Mark, you can put, start to put up your slides. Uh, Mark is a PhD student at Colorado State University. And uh, today he's going to be talking to us about uh, the pattern effect, not in the past, but in uh, looking at near future projections. Uh, thanks, Jonah. Can you uh, hear me and see the screen? Yes. Okay, great. Um, hi, everyone. Oh, actually, I'm going to time myself to be sure I don't cover. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Mark Lessie. As Jonah said, I am a second year PhD student at Colorado State University. Today, I'm going to very briefly talk about counting for uncertainty of projected SST patterns in coupled models. So there are a few known sources of uncertainty in coupled models that research focuses on. This includes internal variability, uh, model or structural uncertainty, differences between how the model responds, um, and also scenario uncertainty. We don't know where uh, or what forcing is gonna be observed in the future. Now, in recent literature, there's also uh, this new uncertainty. We refer to it as SST pattern uncertainty, and this arises due to model deficiencies in atmosphere ocean interaction. And it shows up as mean state or climatological biases and also as trend biases. And a trend bias is really just the inability of a coupled climate model to correctly simulate the SST pattern uh, given a certain forcing. And sometimes these two uh, biases can be related to each other. Now on top of this SST pattern uncertainty, there's also the pattern effect, which states that the evolution of spatial structure of surface warming affects the global mean radiative feedback lambda. So for this project, what we've done is we've developed uh, the Green's function from the German uh, MPI atmospheric model, ECM. And so what you're looking at here is the global mean response of radiative feedback per unit SST warming in each grid box. So for example, if I warm uh, somewhere in the West Pacific, that leads to a largely negative global mean radiative feedback. So putting these two together, we get our motivating question, which is what is the impact of SST pattern uncertainty on projections of feedback and temperature given the influence of the pattern effect? And so we do this by plotting temperature on the left and feedback on the right, just starting with observations uh, from the HADCRA and HADIST data set. On the right, uh, this is actually already using the Green's function. We convolve the HADIST, the HADIST pattern uh, uh, with the uh, the radiative greens function and the temperature greens function, uh, but instead of just dividing them out to give us lambda, we actually do a 30 year sliding linear regression uh, to get the slope of that to give us the lambda and that's what you're seeing here. And you see that this corroborates recent research that shows uh, recently uh, the, uh, feed, the global mean feedback has been decreasing and that's because uh, the East Pacific hasn't really been warming as much as we expected it to. Um, and it may have been cooling slightly. And so most of the warming has been taking place else, elsewhere in the world, which leads us to a more uh, global mean negative feedback. Now we can also <clears throat> take the SSD output from the coupled MPI ESM historical simulation. Uh, and we plug that into the Green's function and we plot that here. Now for this part, instead of just plugging in the SST data set into the temperature Green's function, uh, we actually first plug it into our Lambda Green's function with the radiative and temperature. Uh, Green's functions, and we take the N and the F from the model output, and that gives us the, um, uh, the temperature uh, anomaly through the energy balance model. <clears throat> and so here right off the bat, you can already see that the historical uh, simulation has a less negative feedback, um, which is uh, that discrepancy that does show up in literature. We also take the SST output, mean SST output from the MPI ESM coupled model, uh, plug that into our Green's function, and that gives us the future. And we can also do the same for all the ensemble members of the MPI ESM model. Um, and that gives us an idea of the internal variability uh, between those ensemble members observed for both uh, in the future for both uh, temperature and lambda and feedback. Okay, so this is sort of the new part um, <clears throat> of our research. 
um, we, we need to figure out a way to somehow include this SST pattern uncertainty into our coupled uh, model projections. And so what we do is we just take uh, the MPI ESM RCB 8.5 mean SST output. We focus in on a region uh, that uh, where models had trouble simulating over the historical period. So for example, the East Pacific models were warmer. Um, than observations. And what we do is we slightly decrease the LSST in that region, redistribute it to the rest of the globe so that these lines here have the same global mean SS, uh, SST so that you can directly compare them. Um, and it's, it's basically a fair comparison of the pattern effect. And so for the East Pacific, uh, we're seeing exactly what we would expect, a, a decrease in the global mean feedback because we're taking out warming from the East Pacific and redistributing it elsewhere. And it does actually in fact impact um, uh, temperature projections. Now we can also do this uh, with, for example, the West Pacific, where uh, it's been slightly warmer than we expected. So what we do this time for the dashed line here is that we um, sort of take the warming from the rest of the world, we focus it into the West Pacific, and that leads, leads us to a much more uh, a, a decrease in temperature projection because we observe a much more negative feedback. Um, but the West Pacific is, we're less sure if there's bias there or a, a climatological or trend state bias. So I've plotted both lines here where the, the solid line is if we decrease the temperature um, in that region for the future. And we can also do this for other regions. Um, we also use a different method that I won't really talk about today. And you can also apply this adjustment to each ensemble member since this bias could be a, a, a part of the, the model structure inherently. So you could apply it um, anywhere. So yeah, our, our, our main conclusion is up here, SSC pattern uncertainty substantially impacts projections to almost the same order of magnitude of internal variability. This research demonstrates that fixing SST pattern uncertainty in coupled models would make a difference in projections. Um, yeah, so that's all I have. Thank you. Awesome, thanks, really, really great talk. Um, I'm not seeing any questions in the uh, chat yet. So Joe, Nick, I'll make one comment. Um, you know, I think this is really interesting because, you know, the, the, the um, uh, conventional wisdom is that once emissions go to zero, warming will stop. And everybody seems to believe that. And this really, I've, I've always been skeptical of that and this sort of add some ammunition to my skepticism that if the pattern shifts, even with no emissions, you can still get some warming. I mean, Mark, do you think that's right? Yeah, no, I think I, I would agree with that if the pattern kept shifting in a way that was, yeah, conducive for warming, for sure. Yeah, so I've, I've yeah, that's, a, yeah, I think that's an important thing because everyone says, well, once we get emissions to zero, warming is going to stop and we can stay below 1.5 degrees. And I just, uh, I'm very skeptical of that. So, could I ask a quick uh, clarification question, which is uh, how are you yeah. doing these adjustments? Uh, how are you redistributing? The yeah. Line? So right now what we're doing for this, for this method, there's also another method, um, but I didn't have time to talk about it. The, but for this one, what we're doing is at each year, we identify 3% of the global mean SST anomaly, and we basically take that out of the region or put it into the region and redistribute it elsewhere. So it's still within uh, like realistic bounds comparing to either internal variability of the region or um, like what we've seen in the region before. Awesome, thanks. Uh, I think we have time actually for Kyle to ask his question. Kyle, do you wanna unmute yourself? Oh, sure, thanks. Uh, I was just wondering if you did the same experiment in a coupled setup, that is nudge SSTs in these patches uh, to whatever values you want, would you get the same answer as using the greens functions? I, I, I was trying to think through it and I think you might not get the same answer, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, we, we haven't done something like that uh, yet. Um, I think it's something we'll definitely look into. I, I don't think you would get the same answer mainly because the greens function is just uh, uh, like a linearization of the climate system with respect to you know the SST forcing and the climate response of one variable, um, so I think it would be slightly different. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think it would as well. Yeah, I'd have to think through the how, how it would be different, but that might be an exercise worth doing just to kind of as a sanity check. Yeah, thanks for the great yeah. talk. Thanks. Great, thanks. I think we're going to move on to the next speaker now. Thank you, Mark. Um, our next speaker is Vivian Chow.
a PhD student at Texas A&M. Um, he'll be talking about the impact of the pattern effect on cloud feedbacks. All right, so can everyone hear my voice and uh, see the PowerPoint? Yeah. Perfect. So yeah, I'm Li Wei Chao. I'm a first year PhD student from Texas A&M. And today I would like to talk about the pattern effect and the impact of the pattern effect on the cloud feedback in the observations in the climate models. So let's start with the cloud. Um, we now cloud describe how the cloud and the climate system interact with each other. Um, and cloud feedbacks are remains the larger source of uncertainty in the estimation of future global warming. Although we already have better understanding on different type of clouds in the role in the climate. So in this plot, the X axis is the changes in surface temperature and the Y axis is the changes in radiative flux as it due to a cloud. And by performing the linear regression, we can calculate the cloud feedback and we call it lambda here. So we analyze the observations from 2000 to 2020 and Delta R Cloud is from 2000, um, Delta R Cloud is from series product and is adjusted for radiative kernel, um, is adjusted for cloud masking using radiative kernels. And we have the surface temperature from Eurofi reanalysis. What we found very interesting is that when we split this 20 years into the first and the last 10 years, the cloud feedback actually have very different uh, values. So the first period is from March 2000 to um, July 2010, and the cloud feedback is minus 0.45 watts per meter square per K. While in the second period, the cloud feedback is plus 1.2 watts per meter square per K. So when we subtract the cloud feedback in period one from the cloud feedback in period two, we got delta lambda, which is plus 1.6 watts per meter square per K. And we believe this difference is because the surface temperature warming pattern in period one and period two are different. And this is known as the pattern effect. So in the following, I will focus on the delta lambda and use it to quantify the impact of pattern effect. One question we are interested in is whether the climate models could reproduce this pattern effect. So we analyzed 26 CIMIC-6 uh, models from CIMIC-6 control run and we divide each model into several 10-year segments and calculate the 10-year cloud feedback. And we take the difference between every two lambda to calculate delta lambda. So by performing this pro process for 26 models, we can calculate the distribution of delta lambda for the 76 models. So as shown here, the dashed line is the observation value and the gray region is the 90% confidence intervals from the observations. So we found that 27% of delta lambda will fall in the uncertainty range of the observations and telling us that um, the climate models can reproduce the magnitude of the pattern effect. So now we have found the pattern effect in the observation is large and the model can capture this pattern effect. The next question is whether the next question is um, which region is responsible for this positive delta lambda? So I first calculate the spatial pattern of cloud feedback in two periods by taking the delta R cloud at each point and regress that against the global average surface temperature. And then we take a difference between two um, periods to get the spatial distribution of delta lambda. So here is the observation result. As shown in the figures, the positive delta lambda mainly originated from the East Pacific and also the Southern Ocean and South Atlantic. Um, we did a similar thing for the climate models by taking the average of 27% of delta lambda that falls in the um, observational uncertainty range. And we take the average to get this, this um, spatial patterns. So now that we are comparing one observation to an average of hundreds of delta lambda, so we do not expect these two patterns to be exactly the same. But the results shown here um, suggest that the CIMIC-6 have the ability to capture the main hotspots of Delta Lambda, especially the large um, values here in East Pacific. Um, so to sum up, the cloud feedbacks are dependent on the surface temperature warming pattern, which is known as the pattern effect. And we found a large pattern effect on cloud feedback in service data 
This is related to the intensified warming over its Pacific. And our results um, show that the SMX6 model can reproduce the pattern effect with similar magnitude and main feature of spatial structure. And this also suggests that um, to produce, reproduce the accurate cloud feedback pat, um, in the climate models, it's very important for the models to simulate the realistic surface temperature pattern first. So yeah, thank you. I will take any questions. Awesome, great talk. Thanks, Vivian. Um, let me see. I'm seeing there's a lot of um, follow up in the chat on Mark's talk. Um, maybe I'll kick us off here. Um, which, uh, so in your, the maps you were showing were uh, maps of TOA anomalies, right? Um, have you looked at, have you tried to identify um, which or which regions are causing those, T like where the warming is causing those TOA anomalies? Um, so yeah, for example, so... we know that in the East Pacific, there ha there's been kind of a weak, it hasn't warmed very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the pattern here, I'm showing the, the spatial structure of the difference in cloud feedbacks. So I didn't show the surface temperature pattern here, but we did analyze that. And we found it is mainly due to the um, difference in tem surface temperature at the um, East Pacific also. So uh, we believe the East Pacific pat warming is was um, dominant this um, pattern effect as we see in the observation and climate models. Great, thanks. Anyone else? Okay, um, maybe let's move on to the next speaker, um, but Vivian, please keep an eye on the chat because uh, people have to yeah. put questions there. Thank you. Thank you, Liwei. Um, our, our next speaker is Shia Lee, um, a PhD student at the University of Utah and an organizer here for the symposium. And she'll be talking about the relationship between Arctic sea ice and cloud feedbacks. Can you see my slide? Yes. Okay, perfect. So, hi everyone. My name is Xiang Li, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Utah, uh, working with Dr. Steve Cooper, Core Strong, and GMAs. So, today I will uh, tell a very short story about how do Arctic sea ice needs affect the low level clouds in winter Arctic. So, as you see, an example here for the sea ice needs, and those are just the uh, quasi linear channels of open water as well as thin ice. So, for those who are not familiar with CS needs, uh, I showed a mean lead air refraction distribution over the Pan Arctic. And we see the needs prefer to occur in some hot spots, for example, here in the region over the Beaufort Sea, as well as those coastal regions. Uh, uh, with a lead air refraction about six to nine percent. And over the central Arctic, the lead air refraction is relatively small, two to three percent. However, the lead impacts are not proportionate to their size. And one of the key aspects related to this work is they greatly enhance the both heat and the moisture fluxes over the leads compared to the surrounding thick ice. And this is mainly because of the large air sea temperature contrast, especially in the winter time, it can be up to 40 Celsius degrees. And that means even though we have just 1% of lead cover in the pan Arctic, it's gonna contribute equally to the rest of the 99% of thick ice in terms of the heat exchange between the ocean and the atmosphere, and thus have a large potential impact, potential impact on the low level clouds. And that's sort of what our motivation for this work. So we started with a region that is north of the Alaska, uh, in, represented by within the red curve, and try to answer the key question, how do the wintertime Arctic needs impact the low level clouds and why? So here, I just showed the key results from the observation and analysis. And for the bottom two panels, we're seeing the mean lead air refraction within our domain. And the top panel are the vertical distribution of the cloud frequency as a function of different DBZ thresholds. 
So by comparing the two groups, we see for the right group with the more needs, we actually observe less low level clouds, which you defined as the clouds below two kilometers. And for the other group with fewer needs, we actually observe much abundant low level clouds. So the observations tells us that more needs seems to result in less low level clouds. So why is that? And we hypothesize this is mainly due to the newly frozen needs. As I mentioned before, the needs are are a combination of both open water needs with no CS at all, as well as needs covered by very thin ice. And this is demonstrated by uh, the cloud resolving model simulations here. And the key results we're seeing here are the XZ cross section of simulated clouds from three different experiments. And the top one, we have an open need about four kilometer weight. Uh, in the domain that's parallel to the Y, and we see some clouds. And the furthest second and third one, we double the need air reflection by adding an identical either open need or frozen need, which is a five meters uh, thin ice cover in the domain. And we see if we add an uh, open need, we observe much more clouds. But if we add a uh, frozen need, it seems so. The frozen needs are trying to dissipate these low level clouds and then result in less low level clouds as we observed in this high, uh, need, uh, high need group. So the mechanism behind this is quite interesting because it's mainly because uh, for the frozen need, the thin ice cover on top of the frozen need try to make, remain a relatively large sensible heat flux, which is still about several hundred watts per square meter, but it, almost completely, completely reduce the moisture fluxes. And this combination will create a very dry but convective environment that tends to dissipate the low level clouds. So lastly, uh, I want to briefly talk about the potential climatic significance of this work and also mention what's missing in the powerful tools, the GCMs that most of people are using. So for the CS needs, it's expected that more needs is gonna occur in a warming Arctic climate due to the thinner and the younger sea ice that are more easily to be fractured. And that will imply a stronger impact on the uh, above line low level clouds. And for the low level clouds themselves, especially in the wintertime Arctic, Actually, most of the previous studies have already demonstrated the significance as well as the uniqueness of this type of clouds. For example, those clouds are often mixed risk, long lived, and has has very unique vertical structure with liquid top. And they do uh, have a large influence on the surface energy budget as well as the Arctic climate. So in the near future, I'm gonna work on the potential effects of needs on the Arctic climate through the modulation of low level clouds. So how well do the current GCMs works in terms of parameterizing the need effects? And uh, so there are two main stages in terms of the need parameterization. The first is to parameterize the strong or enhance the surface fluxes over the needs. And the second one is about the vertical distribution of these enhanced fluxes. Well, most of the current GCMs, they do a pretty good job in the first one parameterizing the surface fluxes, but for the second the vertical distribution, it's not physically realistic in terms of the vertical distribution. And in fact, most of the existing GCMs they use a mosaic strategy, which means they limit all the surface fluxes just within the lowest model level. That's just the tens of meters, instead of letting the enhanced fluxes injected to a much deeper depth. So that means the need flux, need effects on the low level clouds is largely underestimated or even missing, uh, especially above those the low level level, lowest level. Uh, so I guess I will stop here and answer any questions if you have. Awesome, that's really great talk, Shia. Um, just as a quick first question, do you have any kind of ballpark estimate on how big a bias uh, these issues could be causing in GCMs? Actually, I don't, because the GCM data is not that reliable so far because they have 
they, it's pretty difficult to simulate it maybe even for the low level calls, no matching the CS need. Um, but in terms of the import, importance of the low level calls, uh, especially their impact on the and surface energy budget and also the uh, energy fluxes at the TOA is in the winter time, that's the long wave fluxes. So I would say it, it could have play a pretty important role. Great, thanks. Uh, Chris Holloway asks, um, um, more leads also appear to increase the higher cloud amounts. Do you know why this might be? And does this also affect lower clouds? Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, so let me go back to right here. Yeah, so the key challenge for this work when we were doing this uh, is the control for the large scale meteorology, right? Because the large scale meteorology affect both the CS needs and as well as the low level clouds. So for our analysis, we're trying to select the profiles or the samples that has that have similar large scale meteorology, but we cannot completely rule out the effect of large scale meteorologies, especially uh, you know the different different large scale flow. So I guess so the, this higher, uh, the difference in this higher level clouds would properly resulted from the slightly difference in uh, large scale meteorology between these two groups. Uh, but we can see still they, it's not as, the difference is not as uh, big as the low level clouds. Um, and also most of the needs we think would have a larger impact on the low level clouds because of the temperature inversion that's sitting here almost uh, uh, or for the entire winter time. So. Okay, great, thanks. Um, we have to move on to the next speaker, but uh, there's already more questions in the chat. Thanks, Shaw. Um, our next speaker is Diego Jimenez de la Cuesta Otero. Uh, is a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute for Meteorology. And uh, he's gonna be talking to us today about tropical stratospheric upwelling and its relationship to tropical ECS. Thank you. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I am Diego Jimenez de la Cuesta from the Max Planck Institute, and I will present the tropical stratospheric upwelling effect on tropical ECS that uh, I have been investigating with Hauke Schmidt. Uh, GCMs usually uh, uh, under warming show that the troposphere raises and this troposphere raising warms and moistens the upper tropospheric and lower stratospheric UTLS region. <laughs> In contrast, the rear Dobson circulation leads to stronger stratospheric upwelling and therefore cools and dries the UTLS. In response to these two processes, the ozone shifts upwards, leading to a more cooling and drying of the UTLS. In, re in, in result, we have a longer emissivity, a, 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 a higher long wave emissivity, which leads to a uh, lower surface warming to equilibrate the forcing and therefore to a lower climate sensitivity. But already the rear adoption circulation cools and dries the UTLS. Then what is the direct impact of the changes in the VDC in the tropical ECS? For answering this question, we have used the 1DRC model Conrad developed here in the Institute by Sally Dassi and Lucas Klut. And we implemented a term that simulates the effect in the uh, temperature of the stratospheric upwelling by simulating it as an adiabatic cooling term with the upwelling velocity here. We set up a PI control experiment in which uh, we set the upwelling speed to 0.2 millimeters per second, which is consistent with uh, observations and also makes uh, our ozone profile consistent with observations. Then we started from this PI control experiment, the climate change experiments, not only doubling the CO2 uh, concentration, but also changing the upwelling speed from minus 0.2 to 0.2 millimeters per second. Obviously, the positive changes are the most consistent with climate change. 
What we found is that if we plot the forcing, the tropical effective forcing against the upwelling, the final upwelling speed, we see a strong dampening of the effective forcing. And if we compare the situation where we don't have any change that is zero in upwelling, that is 0 0.2 millimeters per second, and the case where we have an increase of 0 0.1 millimeters per second, this 0 0.3 millimeters per second case, the reduction in forcing uh, 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 practically um, uh, means a 20% reduction in ECS. In comparison, we, if I, show, I can show it later, if we compare this situation with the net feedback increase, we, uh, we uh, obtain only a 3% reduction coming from the effective, uh, from the net feedback. If now we look at both uh, components, the forcing and the feedback, by plotting the ECS against the effective uh, against the final uh, upwelling speed, and we uh, see the uh, continuous line, we see that the reduction of the ECS between 0 0.2 and 0 0.3 millimeters per second is around 22 percent, which gives us uh, the reason that the effective forcing is the most, uh, uh, the, the more contributor to the reduction in ECS through the upwelling changes. If now we apply the atmospheric uh, composition feedback, that is by making interactive ozone, then we have a reduction of around 28% in the equilibrium climate sensitivity. This means that the uh, atmospheric composition feedback only uh, builds up into the circulation, the already ch the changes of the circulation uh, made by the circulation changes. Uh, then what I have shown you is that the circulation changes partly set the tropical ECS by dampening the tropical effective forcing and with a small contribution from the net, from changes in the net feedback, and that the atmospheric composition feedback at the end built up on this fundamental uh, com uh, contribution from the circulation changes. But this, uh, how can we put this in terms of the global climate sensitivity? Well, it will depend on how the energy exported from the tropics to the extratropics ends up in the stratosphere, in the extra tropical stratosphere. For that, we have this uh, simulation strategy by locking the vert of some circulation, for example, to figure out what are the changes in the global uh, climate sensitivity. With this, I end up my presentation. I am looking forward to your questions. Great, uh, super interesting talk. It's, um, I don't see anything, any questions yet, but uh, have you thought at all about how uh, trends in the brewer drops in circulation over the past, um, you know, over the historical period might have affected, uh, for example, our estimates of the global feedback? Uh, no, uh, but probably that would be another uh, another line of research apart from uh, looking into how what happens in the extratropics for example if we lock the the rural adoption circulation but yes we that could be a very good question yeah okay uh, Keith shine has a question Keith do you want to ask it do you want to unmute and ask Yes, effectively, the water vapor change is uh, what uh, what drives the ECS change. Maybe I can show an extra slide showing uh, the um, the water vapor uh, distribution. Uh, if you can see, uh, this is without change in the upwelling, the uh, the water vapor profile. This is the pre-industrial uh, or the control profile. And if we increase the upwelling, uh, that is only with 0 0.1 millimeters per second of increase in upwelling, we, we obtain a very, very dry profile. It, and practically this is what makes the, 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 uh, the emissivity lower because then we are looking more uh, downwards in the atmosphere.
Okay. Um, Gavin asked an interesting question. Uh, some models don't have stratospheric ozone feedbacks. Does that complicate how you interpret the changes in the CMIP-6 models? Um, probably it complicates more, but it will be more in the in how strong is the is the atmospheric composition feedback. But as I have shown, maybe if they have different changes in the VDC, then the feedback will be the, the atmospheric composition feedback will be uh, uh, weaker or stronger and therefore there will be a strong variation in the climate sensitivity or I mean not as strong as for example the pattern effect but maybe a sizable contribution from the changes from the differences in circulation. Okay great thanks I think we have to move on to our last speaker. Um, but yeah, please keep an eye on the chat. Okay, um, for our final speaker will be Moritz Günther, uh, also a PhD, um, a PhD student who's also at the Max Planck Institute. Um, he'll be talking about ECS in response to volcanic aerosol forcing. So uh, take it away. Yeah, um, I'm also going to set the time and um, yeah, thank you very much for inviting me to speak here. I want to share with you some results I've obtained on the climate sensitivity to volcanic aerosol forcing with my co-authors Hauke Schmidt, Claudia Timrek, and Matthew Tui. And our whole work is very much motivated by this broad consensus in the literature that volcanic aerosol forcing produces stronger feedback than two times CO2 forcing. And we found a lot of sources that claim that this is the case. I haven't found a single one that states the opposite. And it's remains a bit unclear why this is the case. Um, and in order to tackle that question, we performed three types of simulation in our coupled model MPISM. One where we have the CO2 concentration, one where we double it, and one where we use an aerosol optical depth field that resembles an actual volcanic eruption, um, but it's constant in time. So it doesn't have this volcano typical ascend or descent phase. It's just a step forcing like the other two simulation types. And of each um, simulation type, we perform 18 ensemble members for the first decade, and then we let one member run for a thousand years. And here we've computed the feedback parameters according to different definitions from Maria Rugenstein's three flavors paper. And the first thing I'd like you to notice is that in equilibrium, we find almost no feedback differences between the three simulation types. Uh, but we do find very strong differences in the transient periods. So maybe let's first focus on the blue dots, which are from the two times CO2 simulations. And here we find the familiar pattern effect with slightly stronger feedback in the first decade, which weakens on the centennial time scale. But for our cooling simulations, we find this pattern effect to be very much enhanced. So we have even stronger feedback early on and even weaker feedback later. And in the rest of the talk, I'd like to explain to you why this is the case. Um, I think it comes as no surprise that the temperature pattern somehow has to do with this. And in particular, we found the meridional temperature pattern to be key for this effect. We measure this meridional temperature pattern by this very simple tropical temperature pattern index, which is just every time larger than one when the warming or cooling is concentrated in the tropics. And when the temperature change is concentrated in the extra tropics, it's lower than one. And you can see that it correlates really well with the feedback parameter. And I'll explain to you in a second why this is the case. But first I'd like you to notice that there are basically three clouds of points here. So each circle is one ensemble member and um, these crosses are the mean and standard error from the simulations. And um, you can see that all the volcanic aerosol forcing simulations cluster in the strong feedback tropical temperature change part of the plot, while the two times CO2 simulations cluster in the weak feedback extra tropical part of the plot. So this pattern index separates really well the strong from the weak feedback. Now, where does this correlation come from? For this, it helps to look at the feedback parameter as an average of the local feedbacks weighted by the local temperature pattern. And we actually know that the local feedbacks are stronger in the tropics. Um, it's mostly the lapse rate feedback because of this very strong convective coupling that leads to a very top heavy warming or cooling profile, which is very favorable for getting rid of radiation. Um, so this is very negative in the tropics, but we just don't have this in the exotropics and at the poles where it tends to be positive. Um, a similar argument can be made for the surface albedo feedback, which is positive at the poles and zero at the equator. 
And indeed, if we do a kernel feedback decomposition, we find that the lapse rate feedback, uh, which is partially offset by the water vapor feedback, and the surface albedo feedback account for 85% of our feedback differences. Now, the next question we can ask is how this looks on the centennial time scale. And now we have only three members because only three simulations are run that far. But uh, we can again put a fit line through these three, which is almost perfectly parallel to the fit line from the first decade, but shifted by 0 0.7 watts per square meter and Kelvin. Now, uh, unfortunately, there's not enough time here to discuss um, possible reasons for this 0 0.7 watts per square meter and Kelvin. Um, and there's also another question which remains open, which maybe we can discuss later. It is, where does this temperature pattern come from? So why is it that the temperature pattern is so um, focused in the tropics in the aerosol forcing case, and so focused in the extra tropics in the CO2 warming case? Um, with this, I'd like to close, and I'd really like you to take away that it's the meridional temperature pattern, which explains quite well the differences in feedback parameter between the three simulation types. And I'd like to thank you for your attention and look forward to the discussion. Awesome, thanks. Uh, there's a question in the chat from Karsten Haustein. Karsten, do you want to unmute yourself? Uh, yep, can do that. Yeah, I wonder whether all of that was for like your classic CMIP setup. Was that model-based? Sorry, can you repeat the question? So were these results that you have been showing here, are they all model-based, which I would yes. assume they are? And yes, then they would are you expect the exact sort of same pattern effect happening in the real world? Um, so we, so first of all, they are based on a single model even, which is our uh, MPI model, but we checked it against the uh, historical simulations of volcanic eruptions uh, from the CMIP ensemble. And they basically also showed this enhanced tropical pattern index for the other models. Now for the real world, um, I think the problem is that there's a large spread. So we have only one realization of the real world. And you can see that even here, when I assume the spread to be somehow indicative of the spread in the real world, we can basically get any result of, the single, of a single realization. They only hold in the mean. So I wouldn't necessarily expect this to hold true for I don't know, a volcanic eruption that happens tomorrow. Yeah, makes sense. There there has always been this discrepancy between what we observe or what the response to volcanic eruptions in observations is versus the very strong response in models. And yeah, I wonder whether this can be somehow reconciled by doing this kind of exercise. But yeah, cool stuff. Thanks. 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 Okay, um, not seeing anything else. I'll ask a quick question. Oh, uh, Allegra asks, uh, have you looked at uh, Volmip? No, uh, thanks for the question. That's actually the next thing I want to do. So only at the historical simulation so far, but not at Volmip yet. Okay, and then Tim, uh, do you wanna unmute and make your comment? Yep, uh, sure. So. This plot shows that the feedback parameter is most negative for the volcanic forcing on short time scales. My comment is that that seems to have some implications for geoengineering schemes. Have you thought about that? Yes, yes. So I think that's it's very. This is important because, yeah. Well, the experiment I've done is basically very comparable to a geoengineering experiment, right? And. If this is true, then what one will find in an actual geoengineering setup is that the feedback weakens very, very much over time, even more than we already know from the CO2 feedback. So um, this does have implications because this would imply you would have to put more and more sulfur over time just to keep the feedback parameter stable. Um, yeah. Okay, great. I think we're going to move on to uh period of general discussion now. Um, so if anyone has, oh, well, first of all, I should say thanks to all the speakers. I mean, it was a really fantastic set of talks. And also everyone stuck to time, which is great with uh, six speakers. Um, but yeah, if anyone has questions for any of the speakers, please raise your hand or put it in the chat.
can I quickly give it a go? Yeah, please go ahead. And that was, was it for Mark? I'm not sure. It was about the Vaccaro data set. I'm sure someone does know that. Why is it actually so different to the other observational data sets in terms of pattern effect? And answer actually, Mark? Yes, uh, I'll be. Uh, can you see my screen? Yep. Yeah, indeed. I mean, the Vaccaro uh, is very different with, compared to all the uh, other observed SST data sets. Uh, but, uh, I, I don't know exact answer to this question, but I can tell you that uh, Vaccaro uses a very different way of infilling the, uh, I mean, uh, making the spatial coverage complete. So they have used some uh, Gaussian models, uh, some graphical expectation maximization algorithm, uh, which seems to be very different from uh, all the other techniques. And they claim in the paper that it's a better, uh, it is better than the Krieging method to uh, infill. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I kind of roughly took from it, but I wonder, yeah, whether someone else had different views. And do you believe it's better? <laughs> no, I, I, I cannot say anything on that. I, I am trying to calculate the, uh, uh, basically the root mean square difference between the, uh, all the other data set with Vaccaro and uh, the major differences come in the polar regions. Uh, between Vaccaro and all the other data sets. So uh, right now I can co comment only on that. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, um, Eric, do we have also had a question for Anshuman? Eric, uh, do you want to unmute yourself? Uh, I was also wondering about this. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for your talk. That's that's quite interesting. And I guess what I, what I sort of imagine when I think of these pattern effects is kind of a region of broad region of cooling in the Eastern Pacific that sort of shows up in the observations, but really isn't simulated in the models. Um, and, you know, there's something comforting about being able to sort of identify, uh, you know, a spatial pattern that goes along with, you know, the, the, the um, a particular magnitude of the feedback or the, even the sign of it. Is that is it possible or are this, uh, the differences between the different SSC data sets so subtle that you can't see them by eye? Uh, uh, no, you could see them. Uh, I mean, because of time, I haven't shown you. Uh, uh, just let me share my screen again. And I have that. Uh, so here you could see, uh, so what I have done here, I have computed the uh, temperature trends from 1871 to 2017, the entire historical period for all the data sets with respect to the mean of all the data sets. And you could see that uh, if you just, if because Vaccaro is uh, taking the eye, so you could see that the um, Central Pacific is very different uh, from, uh, let's say from AMIP or HER SST, AMIP2 or HER SST. But the major uh, differences are here in HAT4 SST4 the Cowton and Way, but uh, it doesn't much show up in the pattern effect estimates. Hmm. Okay. okay, well, thanks, that's, that's helpful. Yeah, sure, thank you. Uh, since we're almost at the hour, or we're at the hour, um, Christy, do you wanna give a quick plug for the Clivar workshop? Uh, yeah, so there's a Clivar um, workshop on the pattern effect. Uh, several of the people on this talk are either under the committee or invited speakers. Uh, it's supported by NSF and NOAA and DOE. Um, I put a link in the chat, abstracts submission open today. They're gonna, it's going to be open for six weeks uh, and a draft of the agenda is, uh, is already up on the website. Uh, I hope to see a lot of you there, either in person or virtually. Great. Um, I'm going to have to run before too long, but I want to end with uh, two questions which were raised in the chat for Moritz. 
Uh, so Paulo asked if there's any difference in cloud feedbacks across the time periods, because um, we definitely see changes in cloud feedbacks over time and four times CO2 simulations. And then uh, Yuan Jen Lin asked about uh, rapid adjustments and how that affects your results. Yeah, so about the cloud feedbacks, um, we do see changes in cloud feedbacks across the time periods but they don't matter for the differences between the simulations within the same time period. So um, I, I don't know, maybe you remember that they, these two lines were offset by 0 0.7 watts per square meter in Kelvin. And I think actually the cloud feedback is a, it might be a strong contributor to this. I, I haven't checked it in detail yet, but uh, I know that they change over time. And I think this might be one of the things that caused this offset between the time scales. Um, and the other question was about the rapid adjustments. And I don't think they matter very much because it should be accounted for in the effect of forcing. And uh, basically they happen on a time scale of, of what, like weeks maybe. Uh, and what I look at is annual averages. So I don't expect the, um, the rapid adjustments to have a strong effect here. Awesome, thanks. Um, I think, uh, well, maybe wrap things up there. And uh, thanks again to all the speakers. I think this was uh, really successful and uh, we're gonna be having another um, round of lightning talks in either next month or the month afterwards. I can't quite remember. Um, but yeah, thanks so much to everyone. Thank you. Thanks for having Thank us. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for inviting us.